Dr. Lin, and I'm going to talk about propagation of specifically supernovae feedback in turbulent environments. This is work I've done in collaboration with uh, Florent Renaud and Oscar Augers, all of us from Lund University. So, as we discussed very much on specifically on Wednesday, supernovae are very important in regulating star formation via outflows and other, other elements. However, the problem is that they evolve on, uh, on scales of tens of parsecs and on time scales of 10 kiloyears, which, are, which can, be, can be hard or even impossible to capture. And this is a problem, again, since the low resolutions will lead, will lead to overcooling of the supernova, underestimating the momentum injection. And in order to solve this, you often need subgrid models or delayed cooling schemes, which, if they're not calibrated correctly, you get something like this, which is a galaxy which Oscar Algert managed to create where you had two high supernovae feedback. So there's been several studies on, supernova, on single supernovae in, in different environments. Specifically, I'm going to highlight Martis et al. 2015, Kim Mostreicher, Kim Mostreicher 2015, and Hayd et al. 2016. And they all generated an inhomogeneous environments, such so like the one over here from Matisse et al., where you have high-density structures surrounded by low-density gas in which they detonate a supernova and try to see if that made any difference. And what they generally found was that the ISM structure, the details, i.e. the higher-density clumps, does not really affect the evolution of the momentum injection or the energy injection. Rather, it's the average properties, such as the average density, which is important in this regard. However, we thought that something was missing from this picture, and that is that the gas that they simulated was mostly static. So we wanted to look at turbulence gas. So if you do some simple calculations, you can see that from a, from a GMC-like cloud of 100 parsec, you have a turbulent energy of roughly 10 to the 51 ergs, which Apple's origins comparisons is roughly the energy of typical supernovae. So we wanted to do this in an actual turbulent environment. So we did this using the AMR code RAMSYS in a volume of 100 parsec cubed uh, with a turbulent forcing module from Padawan and Nordland, 1998. And using this, we generated a, a cloud of roughly five, with a velocity dispersion of roughly five kilometers per second um, in, with an average density of 100 h per cc. We let this run for several turnover times so that it reaches a statistical um, steady state, after which we detonated a, uh, we injected 10 to 51 ergs of thermal energy into the center of the box. We did this over several realizations to, since the structure of the, of the gas could be widely different and to capture all of the different aspects. Now, so did it, this affect the momentum reaction? Well, not really. So here, what I'm plotting here is the momentum of the, of the supernova in a turbulent environment in red with the with the scatter. And to com in comparison, I'm also plotting the expected evolution in a homogeneous environment. So here in dash dotted, we have for 100 h per cc, i.e. the average density of our box. And in, and in dotted, we just have for lower density of 10 h per cc. And as we can see, the injected momentum is slightly higher, uh, but and it seems to follow our evolution closer to lower density environment than the average of the box. However, it's not, sig not a significant change. Um, the actual impact of the kin kinetic energy of the turbulence does not in come, into, come into question until the larger scales where we see some annihilation of momentum. However, we also s noticed something else which was noted in the other papers but not really highlighted. And that is that the, super that the supernovae tended to expand into the low density gas which then act as escape channels. Now this could, this means that essentially that the low density, that you can have a highly asymmetric evolution which is not fully captured by spherically symmetric models such as the red circle here which is for the same density of the environment. Uh, this also means that you leave the high density filaments intact which could greatly affect not only the evolution of the supernova but also the, its impact on its environment. So. I want to take a case example of this specific supernova. So we can see here that on the left, it's closer to its uh, homogeneous solution, but however, it has a lot of less dense environment it can move into around here. So by taking, looking at bins and azimuthal angles from the progenitor star, we look at the first point away at which we find the uh, supernova sh shock front, and this is the histogram we get from that. And as we can see, it's, it varies widely across the shock front. 
you don't you don't only have the stalling from the high density filaments, but we also have from the diffuse gas a much wider range in radii. And again, this is mainly due to that the escape channels of the low density gas are essentially allows for uh, for the gas to flow out. And this could all then affect where we actually find our momentum. So here we have the accumulated momentum of the, soup, of the shock of the bubble. And as you can see, we find much of it in the initial shock front, but it also spreads out across the entire thing. And this is even more apparent in the mass. So here we have the accumulated mass with respect to radius. And we can see, again, a lot in the initial shock, but it spreads out across the entire thing, and it's also much lower than expected from our, our environment. So what we can say from this specific case study is that this supernova coupled to lower densities and, and low density gas while leaving the high density filaments intact. But this is just one of the cases. We have multiple, multiple cases. We have these type of supernovae which tends to expand out into low density gas while others didn't really have that chance and acted more like their homogeneous evolutions. So, <sighs> There's, of course, things missing in our study. Um, we do not include any pre-stellar feedback, which would generate a more low-density environment around, it, around the progenitor star. Uh, we're also not considering the impact of multiple supernovae, but this has been studied in uh, Fielding et al., uh, which used similar, similar to us, used uh, generated turbulence and drove the generated turbulence and in which they detonated multiple supernovae. Um, and the aspect I want to focus more on, and which is, I think, a bit more important, is actually the position of this progenitor star with respect to high density filaments within the galactic clouds. So, so one would expect that this, the, the star, yeah, the star is born or is generated in high density structures, but however, due to asymmetric drift, you will start to migrate away from the, dense, the high dense structures, which means that your position with respect to the high density structures within the GMC is rather uncertain. So what this actually means, so as I've shown with the radial plots, is that we can't really model properly the, the propagation of supernovae with simple semi-analytical spherical models. Instead, you, you actually need to see how the, how the gas looks at a subparsec scale with where the density structures is actually located, which depends not only on this, not depends, which depends lots on the turbulence, and not only on the Mach number, but also the injection scale. What is actually driving the turbulence? Is it supernova? Is it supernova feedback themselves, or is it again, just last talk, gravitational instabilities? And we have no reason to expect that these are the same in all different environments, we, such as such as in, in local universe or in mergers where you have more tidal forces, or even in a high redshift, where you also have higher, where you could have higher velocity dispersions. So in order to actually capture supernovae feedback across, across all time, you probably, you should need, not only to capture the small scale physics, but also the larger scale extragalactic imp, impact of, on the turbulence and density structures. So that was my talk, um, these are my conclusions. So. Total momentum ejected by supernova feedback does not great, greatly depend on the turbulent structures that we can see. However, lowest density escape channels allow for, yeah, allow for the supernova to, um, to, move, to move further away and to extend over larger radii than expected. And this is something that spherical models do not fully capture. In, in fully capture. So in order to actually simulate this and take this into account, we would need zoom in simulations of roughly half a parsec, not, on, not only including small scale physics such, such pre stellar feedback, but also galactic or even cosmological scales, scales. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Yeah, I liked very much the, the fact that that your hot gas flows into these kind of channels. But actually, before the supernova explodes, you know you have winds, and especially UV field. 
-hmm. and that will generate a, an ionized bubble yeah. around and that actually already begins to flow into channels so it's carves maybe already something out where then later on the bubble has an easier way to go through so uh, can you estimate how important this effect is which you haven't included yet so again that would affect very much in, on the like, the density difference between what what the so the, the high so the, I'm guessing the density within this bubble is much lower, right? So then the effect of it of the flow in, into it would be larger. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So since it's a, since it's lower density, it would flow faster into it, and you would probably amplify the effect. And especially since you have less gas, you would also cool slower, which means that you would probably have a longer evolution of the supernova. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a quantitative uh, expressions to um, quantify the, the growth of the bubble, given the, um, the escape channels? Uh, no, so I do not have that, and I don't. I don't know if that's really possible since the distribution of radii does not seem to be consistent across different supernovae bubbles. So I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't think it's really reasonable to consider them as spherical by picking an average radii and then trying to expand them across that. Um, and also, I don't think you have a specific distribution to pull from to actually generate these kind of structures. Well, what I have in mind is that if you remember the model I presented a few days ago, what I would like to know is the time evolution of the region in which star formation is suppressed by, yeah. by the bubble. And I guess you can estimate that from, from your simulations. Uh, it may not be totally robust, but at least some, some qualitative correction to the spherical yeah. uh, simulation. It would be very interesting. Yeah, I can uh, something to look into. More questions? If not, uh, let's thank Locke again.